Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January 2022 meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography SIG meeting. It is absolutely fantastic to have you all here tonight, especially as such a large crowd like this. Of course, I want to thank all the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society members for joining us tonight. And I also want to thank uh, those of you that found out about it through the Introduction to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series. So it is great to have you all here. This is a really good turnout for a SIG meeting, much better than we ever anticipated. Um, so without, without further ado, I want to jump right into it because there's no time to waste. So after starting as an amateur astronomer in the early 1960s, our guest speaker graduated from Caltech in 1972 with a degree in astrophysics and spent another year in graduate school at UC Santa Cruz. He then transitioned to the business world where he worked in the software engineering field for 25 years, holding various positions in development and senior management. After retiring, he returned to his astronomy hobby and now spends much of his spare time doing deep sky imaging and developing astronomy related software, including PhD2. He's also uh, been involved with the open source PhD2 project as a developer since 2013. So please welcome Mr. Bruce Waddington. You're muted. He's on mute. Bruce, you got to unmute yourself. I just unmuted myself. How's that? Perfect. I want to do. OK, so can everybody see that screen then? Does that look yeah. OK? Yes, yeah, so it looks okay. great. All right. Um, so this is actually the first uh, presentation I've done that's quite like this, uh, and I, I I've wanted to do this before because a lot of times uh, people just jump into astro imaging and guiding and they're immediately plunged into how do I connect my camera and what settings do I need for this kind of software. And I think uh, they can get a long way down that road without really understanding um, kind of the theory of auto guiding, what the basics are, and what the typical problems are that you have with auto guiding. So I kind of wanted to give more of a big picture here. Um, I don't intend for it to be superficial at all. We'll get into some technical details on how this stuff all works. But hopefully this will give you a context and kind of a big picture so that when you are imaging and guiding yourself, uh, you'll have a better idea of what's really going on. So we'll plunge right into it. Um, and this is, I calling it Guiding 101, uh, Basics of Auto Guiding. And just to start, uh, to give you some context, this is what guiding was like without the auto. So this is a famous uh, picture of Edwin Hubble uh, with the ubiquitous pipe in his mouth and the hand controller in hand, uh, pretending to guide the 48-inch Schmidt scope in Palomar through what is uh, a fairly substantial sized guide scope. Um, and this obviously is not the way we do it anymore. Uh, some of you may be as old as I am and may recall back in the film days, um, this is how people had to guide the telescope for filming. Um, I actually did this once just to see what it was like. And it wasn't a pleasant experience. I stood out there for 20 minutes collecting one image and by the time the image was done, I felt like I'd been standing out there all night. So it's not surprising that uh, people wanted to get some technology involved here and find some way to do this that didn't involve standing around with your eye pressed to an eyepiece for hours on end. So I guess the first place to start is um, why do we have to do this at all? Why is auto guiding required? And in some cases, uh, what is the situation where it's not required? And the basic idea is that you presumably have a telescope on a mount and it's capable of tracking the sky at the sidereal rate. And so if you put an eyepiece in there and you watch what's going on, 
uh, whatever it is you're looking at, the star or the nebula or whatever, stays reasonably well centered in the field of view. You don't have to fool with it or, or worry about it. And that's because the mount is tracking at the sidereal rate. But if you put a camera on there instead of your eyepiece and you wanna take a long exposure photograph, you're gonna immediately encounter some problems. And, and just to set a context here, uh, when I'm talking about long exposure uh, photographs, I'm really talking about exposures that might run anywhere from three minutes, maybe up to 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, um, not 30 seconds. So if you try to take those kinds of exposures uh, with a typical telescope that most of us use, you'll find that the stars uh, in your image aren't round anymore. They tend to look like little rods. And those come uh, from a number of errors. And, and there's about four of them listed here. There's gonna be misalignment of the RA axis on the celestial pole. You can't ever get that done perfectly. Uh, there will be any number of mechanical errors that are part of the drive axes, the drive system in the telescope and the mount, notably in right ascension. Um, there will also be some flexure of the telescope gear. You know, if you have to think about this, that telescope is going to be tracking potentially horizon to horizon, or maybe from the horizon up to the zenith. And you've got a lot of, a lot of stuff hanging off that mount and the gravitational loading on all of that equipment changes as the telescope rotates at the sidereal rate up toward the zenith. And that's gonna cause various kinds of flexure. Things just have a tendency to move around because of the pull of gravity, all of which is going to distort the star images um, in your pictures. And finally, there's atmospheric refraction, uh, which generally isn't a big issue, although as you get closer to the to the horizons, it starts to be more of a factor. So there's any number of things here that are interfering with your ability to get nice sharp pictures with nice round stars. And that's why um, people need to do auto guiding. Obviously, the, the amount of the problem, the size of the problem you have with those elongated stars is gonna depend on the length of the exposure time. So as I said, if you're just doing maybe 20 or 30 second exposures, you can probably get away with that. In a lot of cases, the stars will be reasonably round. But as the exposure times go up and you're trying to get more data on fainter objects, um, you have to do something else. Now, at the opposite end of the spectrum, um, if you have uh, some pretty sophisticated gear, you could also avoid having to do auto guiding. Um, this would involve mounts that have um, absolute high precision, absolute encoders on both axes. These are typically very expensive mounts. Uh, they also usually have to have detailed tracking models that are built for them to compensate for polar alignment error, mechanical flexure, and things of that nature. And of course, if you keep your, your exposure time short enough, you can get away without auto gain. But for most of us, um, these conditions really don't apply, and we have to have some way of correcting for those errors uh, that would crop in if we didn't do any kind of guiding at all. So what I'm gonna do is start out by giving you the big picture of how guiding, how the guiding process works. And we'll be talking about this, the, each of these steps in more detail as we go along. So the idea is that at its heart, guiding is conceptually pretty simple. You are going to take a picture of some small spark part of the sky uh, through, a, through an independent camera. And you're gonna find stars that are located in that camera image. And you're gonna measure the positions of those stars. And the very first time you do this, you make a record, you keep a note of where each of those stars is located. Now, in a lot of cases, you may only be using one star um, but the same principles apply. If it's easier to think about it with just one star, um, that's okay to do. So you'd have that one star, you'd figure out where it's located uh, on the camera sensor. And then you would, in the very next case, you would skip ahead. You wouldn't measure tracking errors. You wouldn't talk to the mount. You'd go back and take another 
exposure through your guide camera. And this would typically be a second or two later. Then you're gonna go back and you're gonna find those same stars in that image. And now when you measure those positions, you're gonna find in all likelihood that those stars have moved by a tiny amount on that guide camera sensor. And these are the tracking errors that we wanna be able to measure and compensate for. So in that case, we go to the next step and we compute what those tracking errors are. How far have those stars moved, not from the last exposure, but from the original lock points that we established when we took the very first guide camera image. So we wanna be dealing with cumulative errors, not incremental errors. And once we figured out how far they've moved, we then have to figure out what commands do we need to send to the mount that will cause it to move, typically by a very small amount, to essentially push all those stars back to their original positions on the image. Once we do that, we go back and we do take another picture. So essentially, all night long, the guiding software is going to go around in this loop, doing these four steps over and over and over. This is really a rinse and repeat operation. So now what I'll do is talk a little bit about what choices we have in how we accomplish each of these four steps and a little bit of, of the underlying logic of how it works. To start with, uh, how do we get this guide, guiding image that we want to use for measuring star positions? And as I said, you need a second camera or at least a second camera sensor for doing this because you're gonna be taking these relatively short one, two, three, four, five second exposures independently from the long exposure that's being taken with your main camera. And then so the question is, well, how do we get light into this guide camera? And there are several options for that. Um, the first one, and probably the one that nearly everyone tries at first, is to use a secondary telescope, a guide telescope, typically a small or medium-sized refractor that the guide camera is attached to. And that's used to, to sample the star images and star positions through some small part of the, of the nighttime sky. A second option allows you to do away with that secondary telescope and use what's called an off-axis guiding assembly that will let you actually collect light through the main telescope. I'll show you how that works. But if we go back to the separate telescope and separate guide scope, I'll show you more about that because that's the most uh, traditional solution. The third option is one I don't really want to talk about tonight. Uh, it's a situation where you can use a device, it's called an adaptive optics device. Um, it behaves like an off-axis guider, but the corrections don't go to the main mount. They actually go to an active optical element. It's a tip-tilt element that actually deflects the image uh, by tiny amounts to correct for these unwanted uh, star movements. And I said, that's a fairly sophisticated thing. It's not something we wanna get into uh, in this talk. So here's an example of using a separate guide scope. Um, this is the main uh, telescope that's used for the imaging. This is a 12 and a half inch um, reflecting telescope. The main camera is down here mounted on the back end of it. And this is the one that's gonna be collecting light all night long with say 10 minute exposures. Okay, up here is a separate little refractor telescope that's mounted to the top of the big scope, and it has a separate guide camera sitting right here. And this thing is going to be banging away all night long doing one or two second guide camera exposures. So this looks like a simple enough solution. Uh, doesn't have to be terribly expensive. Um, the optics in this little guide scope don't have to be you know, world-class. Um, and this is why it's an appealing way for people to get started with auto guiding. So you say, well, if it's that easy, then why would there be other alternatives? And the reason for that is because of what is called differential flexure or differential movement. The problem is that there will be slight 
differences in how those two telescopes track the sky. There'll be differential movement between the guide telescope and the main scope. So what the guiding software is doing is correcting for all of the tracking errors that it sees through the guide scope. But those are not identical to what would be seen through the main scope. So the outcome of this is that you can have nearly perfect guiding through the guide scope, and then you go and start processing your main camera images, and you find that you've got elongated stars or some other uh, unwanted movement there that's ruining your star images. So before I talk about, you know, any more about that, let me go back and to this picture. And you say, okay, if, if you know that the problem is differential movement between this scope and this one, then you want to do everything you can mechanically to try to prevent that from happening, or at least minimize it. So in this case, this happened to be my scope. This is the way I ran it eight or 10 years ago. Um, and so what? there's a big heavy plate here that's bolted into the top of the main telescope. There's This is a Las Mondi dovetail plate. It's a heavy thing. The guide scope is mounted with these two widely spaced clamshell type adapters. So these can be cinched down very tightly. There is in fact no focuser on this at all. So because the focuser moves around and it sags and that creates problems. So this is nothing more than a push pull thing um, with an incredibly tight, you know, think channel lock pliers once it's actually focused. So it took me hours to push and pull this thing to get it focused. But once it was, I had this cinch down uh, unbelievably tight. And the whole thing is kept as close as possible to the main scope. So it doesn't have any of these big tall mounting blocks that cause uh, additional flexure to occur. So, you know, this was a fairly careful arrangement. And my experience was that I could take 10 minute exposures with this and get good guiding results and good images through the main camera. And the main system was running at 1800 millimeters focal length. If I tried to go to 15 minute exposures, I started getting elongated stars. And I would have to start rejecting enough frames through the main camera that it was no longer worth it to do it this way. So there will always be some limitation. You just, ahead of time, you don't know where it's gonna be. And it all depends on the devilish details of how all of this stuff is mounted and secured. So if you really don't wanna spend time on that, uh, your best bet is to go to a different solution, which is gonna be the off-axis guider. So obviously the impact that's on main images because of differential flexure has to do with how long the exposure times are. It also has to do with the image scale that you're using. This is the first time that I'm gonna use that term. What I mean by image scale is basically a metric of how much of the nighttime sky does it take to cover one pixel on the camera? And these are, this number is always measured in terms of arc seconds per pixel. So it, for what we would call a coarse image scale, it might be five or six arc seconds to cover one pixel. In a very fine image scale that you would have with a long focal length scope, it might be a half arc second per pixel. And the smaller that number, the more demanding are the requirements for guiding and tracking because you will get small amounts of movement in the guide telescope and those will translate into large apparent movements of the guide stars. So you might get a movement of a few microns and that will generate a guiding error that looks like five arc seconds. And that's a very difficult thing to, to control. This uh, situation has actually gotten worse over the last 10 years or so because the cameras we use now are really uh, use sensors that are designed for, tel for, for cell phones. So the, the pixels are incredibly tiny, you know, two, three, four micron pixels. Whereas in say 10 years ago, guide cameras and imaging cameras were using larger pixels 
uh, typically about twice as large as the ones we're using now. All of which means that the amount of precision that's required in, in everything we're doing has increased by about a factor of two. So this is the solution uh, that I mentioned before of an off-axis guider. Um, and the idea here is that this is what an off-axis guider looks like. There's a big opening here, and this is sufficient to, to handle all of the light cone that's coming out of the main telescope. But if I had really drawn this completely, the, the sensor on your main camera isn't this big. And so the, the main camera sensor is just sitting down here in the center of this aperture, which means that there's light coming in through the telescope that is outside the field of view of your main camera. So we can take advantage of that by putting a little prism in here. This is this little gizmo that's shown right at the top. And so we steal some of that light that's coming in through the main telescope and we bounce it up here to the top where we can put a guide camera. Okay, so that eliminates the need for that secondary telescope. And it also basically eliminates problems with differential flexure because whatever the guide software is seeing through the guide camera is exactly the same as what's gonna be seen through the main camera and the main telescope because that's where the light's coming from. So now we go back to this uh, four-step process of guiding. And I mentioned that um, we want to be able to find star locations in, uh, in the image every time we take an exposure. So let's take a look at how that's going to be done. Um, this is, a, this is an, uh, an idealized view of what a star actually looks like on a, on a camera sensor. Um, so they're not just infinitesimally small pinpoints of light because of diffraction. I think most of you probably are familiar with this idea of what a diffraction image looks like and this thing called an airy disk in the center. But this is what the star looks like to the guiding software. There's this central bright disk. Now it's not uniformly bright like this picture indicates. This is just an artifact of how it was, was developed. And then a drop off in brightness as you go further away from the center. So you get out into these diffraction rings and so you get a drop off. And if you actually look at the light curve as you move away from the center, it looks like a Gaussian curve. And what we're trying to do is compute what is the center of this star image. And we do that for all of the images that we're using uh, for guiding. So we do that. Uh, by computing what's called its centroid or center of mass position. And the way we do it is we, we have a tracking region uh, for each star and we locate where that star is in the tracking region. We have to measure what the background level is uh, coming from the sky background and from noise in the camera. And we measure the brightness values across the range that is covered by that airy disk and we compute the same as a center of mass value. Now, the center of mass is a very robust kind of a measurement uh, because it's not strongly sensitive to, for example, the shape of the star. So we're not insisting that the stars be absolutely circular. Um, and for those of us who, you, who are doing off-axis guiding, that can be important. Um, and so we just compute the center of mass value for each of the stars. And then we, as I said before, are gonna be interested in how that center of mass position has changed from that original reference image that we took to start the whole guiding sequence. Now it's, it's generally better if you, if you can, if the software is able to use multiple stars in the frame. So uh, in a lot of cases, people are, end up doing single star guiding and that, that's fine. Uh, but it, statistically, it's better, uh, assuming that the algorithms are implemented well and are clever enough. Um, you get statistically better performance by measuring and averaging the positions of multiple stars in the field. Typically, 
the centroid calculations are surprisingly accurate. Uh, normally, you're going to have an accuracy down around a tenth of a pixel uh, or better. 0.05 pixels is not beyond reach. So the measuring engine here in terms of computing the star positions um, is incredibly sensitive. And that's why people can routinely get what is called a sub-pixel guiding um, and very high accuracy guiding if the hardware will allow it. So then, as I said, we, we know where those stars are. We know how far they've moved from their original lock points, their reference positions. And now we, we need to figure out what do we have to send to the mount to be able to move it by a small amount and get things back positioned where we want them. And that's uh, actually not a difficult problem. Um, the only thing that you have to deal with is that there are two coordinate systems here. So you have the XY position of the camera sensor. So you're measuring these uh, star positions by their XY locations on the guide camera sensor, but that has to be translated into corrections for right ascension and declination, which is what the mount means. And those two will not be the same. So it's, it's important that the guiding software be able to do that conversion. It's really a, a transformation. It's not particularly complicated. But to do that, um, there has to be some kind of an initial calibration process that's done by the guiding software. Um, every different piece of guiding software I've ever seen has some way of doing a calibration. And it really boils down to figuring out how far does the star move for a particular sized guide correction. I say, how far does it move? I mean, how far does it move apparently on the sensor? And in what direction is it gonna go for each of a right ascension or a declination guide command? So what we really are interested in is both the magnitude of the movements and their direction. And this is what it would look like. So this is an example of a calibration that happens to be done uh, with PhD2. So the way this works is you start out in right ascension, it's red in this case. And so the software is sending down fixed sized guide commands, telling the telescope to move west. So you can see these are the star positions that we measured on the sensor, bump, 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 bump. And the stars marching along, it took about 12 steps to go out here. And then we told it to quickly reverse direction, go back to where it started. And then we do the same thing in declination. So these are commands to move north, okay? And then we get all done and we tell it to move back south and get back to where it started. So you can see that the angle here doesn't exactly match the X and Y coordinates of the camera sensor. So that's part of what has to be done in this transformation. When we measure an XY movement on the sensor, we are able to translate it into the corresponding declination and right ascension errors. So here's another way of looking at it. Um, if this is the lock point here, the camera sensor axes go left and right and up and down, that's X and Y. And in this particular example, the RA and DEC reference system is where the red and blue lines go. None of this needs to be of any interest to you. It's all handled in the software. You'll occasionally see people on forums um, telling you that you need to be really, really, really careful and make sure that these coordinate systems are the same, that, that, the, that the camera is rotated so it's exactly aligned with right ascension and declination. And that isn't true. Uh, it's not even helpful to do that. Um, so you don't worry about it. But that's part of what has to be done in terms of being able to guide the, the mount and the camera. So we now figured out at this point how much the telescope needs to move in right ascension and how much it needs to move in declination to push those guide stars back so that everything is back where it started. So we have to send commands down to the mount to get it to do that. 
And there's a number, as usual, a number of choices for how you might want to do that. Um, what I refer to as a legacy approach is to use what's called an ST4 guide cable. And that's just a little cable that goes directly from the guide camera down to the mount. Um, it's a somewhat specialized cable. It, it, people get it confused. It looks like a telephone cable, but it's wired differently than that. And unfortunately, it's prone to snagging and dragging and getting hung up on stationary parts of the mount. And it's also fairly sensitive to damage to the conductors. And a lot of times that's because people are, you know, regularly tearing down and reassembling the scope, you know, maybe once every night. And so this cable ends up um, being disconnected and handled and mangled. And once the connectors are damaged or broken, um, you've got a failing system. And the problem is you're not, it's not going to be easy to know that that's what your problem is. So the biggest issue here is that it's, these guiding operations through that cable are essentially blind. Um, there's no feedback to know that it was done. There's no logging. There's no visibility from a software point of view to know whether the mount um, ever got the command and if so, what it did with it. Um, and equally annoying, uh, you have to do a recalibration every time you slew the scope to a different location. Uh, or every time you do a meridian flip. And that's because there's no pointing information available this way. So the guiding software, if it's using only an ST4 guide cable, doesn't have any idea where the scope is pointing. And so it can't make um, automatic adjustments to the calibration data based on pointing location. Um, and the, the final objection to this method is that the, the process of telling the mount to move for a particular length of time in a particular direction is a multi-step process. So you, you actually have to send it a command that says, okay, start moving in deck, say. And then you have to go in the software and do, go into a timing loop for however long you want that guide command to last. And then you have to send another command down to the mount to tell it to stop. So it's a three-step process. And if there are problems, for example, in the PC uh, with the accuracy of this timer, then that's going to affect the accuracy of the guide command. And this becomes more of a problem um, when you have smaller and smaller guide command uh, durations. So with a, something like a long focal length scope, you might be trying to send guide corrections to the mount that are only 20, 30, 40 milliseconds. And it's very hard for something like a Windows uh, personal computer to measure time periods at that level of accuracy. So this will work. Um, people still do it, but it's not any longer the recommended approach. What is the recommended approach is um, to use one of the industry standard uh, software interfaces uh, from the guiding software to the mount. Um, for Windows-based systems, that's been ASCOM for many, many years, well over a decade. And the successor standard now is Alpaca. That's kind of, those two things are the gold standard uh, for this sort of activity. And it's used by thousands of users around the world uh, to, to guide and, and manipulate the telescope. Uh, the Indy standard is roughly equivalent. It's available on other platforms like Linux and Macintosh. So generally, uh, there is a way uh, for you to be able to do guiding without having to rely on ST4. It does require some additional software to be installed, um, what is kind of humorously called drivers for these mounts. They're not really drivers. Uh, it's just software that knows about the specifics of the particular mount that you're using, whatever type it might be. And those are readily available, um, sometimes from the mount vendor, uh, other times from independent developers who can write these things. And these things implement what's called pulse guiding. And one of the benefits of that is that it's a, 
it's a transaction. It's, it's a one-time communication to the mount that says, I want you to move in this direction for this length of time. And all of that timing that we talked about a few minutes ago is all done in the mount firmware. So you're not relying on being able to get back to the mount at the right time to tell it to stop moving. Um, these approaches also provide um, logging and end-to-end -end visibility. So when you need to get help, for example, on the PhD2 forum about problems that you're having with guiding, we can use that additional information to get a better idea of what the mount was really doing, what commands it really received. This also eliminates the need to recalibrate every time you slew the scope. So most people um, may do one calibration at the start of the night, and then they'll just continue to use that for the rest of the night. Those of us that have permanent setups can do a calibration and use it for months. Um, you'd use it until, for some reason, you had to jigger around with the hardware and you know, rotate things or move them around. And finally, it's one less moving cable uh, that you have to worry about routing and keeping from getting hung up on some part of the mount, which sounds comical um, if you've never done this, but it really is an incredible nuisance and it causes no end of trouble. So if the fewer the cables, the better. So we've now kind of made a full circuit around this thing and, and have talked about how each of these steps are actually implemented. And as I said, uh, for as long as you're guiding on a target, uh, the guiding software is just gonna keep marching around this loop, repeating these four steps over and over and over again, separated by whatever the length of the guide exposure is, typically one or two seconds. So, you know, it's rinse and repeat. And at this level, this doesn't really look like rocket science. I mean, it's not conceptually very difficult. Um, but of course, as usual, the devil's in the details. So what is it that causes us to have trouble with guiding? I mean, you, if you talk to people, they'll tell you that auto guiding is kind of a black art. It's hard to get right. It's something you have to pay attention to. And having been doing this now for a long time, um, I would have to agree with that. It is a little bit of a black art. And it's because there are a number of forces against you, all right? There's a number of things that are gonna stand in the way of your uh, wanting to do simple kinds of guiding and get really good results. So one of the things that I think is a big surprise to people um, is the incredible demand for accuracy and precision that we're talking about here. And this is a, one of the many cases in astronomy where we end up dealing in units uh, in measurements that we're just not accustomed to dealing with at all. So if we talk about what the guide camera can actually see when it's seeing these tiny deflections of the stars on the frame, well, the pixels are anywhere typically from three to nine microns across. So if you get a, a movement of the star of as little as five microns, the guide camera is going to see that. That's going to look like a problem. Well, those kinds of numbers are less than a fifth of the thickness of a human hair. So none of us probably have any practical experience with measuring things this small. But this is the world we live in when we're talking about doing a long exposure imaging and guiding. And the, all of these tiny little errors come from all sorts of things um, that we wish we didn't have to deal with. So there's gonna be tracking errors in the mount. We'll talk more about that. There's all kinds of other devilish things. There's wind gusts, there's vibration. There's things that are gonna bang into the mount or hit it or touch it. There's cables that are gonna drag or snag and, and pull by just tiny amounts on the guide camera. And any of those little fittings and mechanical attachments and threaded screws and knobs and all this other stuff, if any of those things are even a little bit loose, 
it's going to allow movement on the scale that we're talking about here. So one of the things that I've occasionally suggested that people do when they're just getting going is to get a sense of how sensitive this all is. Go ahead and set up your scope, set up your guide scope, and just start looping with the guiding software, meaning taking exposures, and you'll be able to see what the star field looks like on the screen. And then just go out and start touching things, right? Don't bang into them. Just put your finger in different places on the guide camera, the guide telescope, maybe on the cables, and see if you can get that star to only move by one or two pixels. And the answer is you probably won't. You'll touch something and the whole thing will go out of the field of view or the guide star will move by 40 or 50 pixels. And that will give you kind of a firsthand impression of just how sensitive all this stuff is. Hold on a second. So we have this very high demand for precision, even though we don't think of it that way. And by the way, what we really want is for that whole system to track the sky object, the nebula, the globular cluster, whatever it is. We want it to track with that level of accuracy all night long from horizon to horizon. And if it doesn't do that, we're going to be unhappy because we're going to lose camera exposures. We're going to be wasting time out there. And as I said before, the fact that we're now using uh, guide cameras and sensors with increasingly small pixels just make this, makes this all a lot harder. So that's the first thing that makes this hard is the, is the tiny amounts of movement we're worried about and the high level of accuracy that we demand as imagers. Now, if that weren't enough, we have everyone's favorite thing, which is astronomical seeing. And this is something I think is probably not very well understood by most people that get into amateur astronomy. What we mean by seeing is something very specific. It's, it's turbulence. It's the jitter that you see in star images. And it's produced by movement of air cells in the atmosphere. So we're not talking about um, sky brightness or whether or not the moon is up or any of that kind of thing. We're only talking about the seeing effects caused by atmospheric movements. And one way to think about this is that these air cells are whizzing around through the atmosphere uh, and they go up thousands of miles and they all behave differently at different distances from the surface of the earth. And they're moving through a column of air that you're looking up through. So if you imagine, your telescope pointing at a target, and imagine extending that telescope up. It forms a column that moves through a column of air all the way up to the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And that, that column is what you're looking through when you're focusing on whatever it is, M42 or whatever. And you've got all these air cells that are moving through there laterally. And each of those little cells behaves like a little lens. And because the temperatures of the cells are different, it's, it has the same effect as having those lenses moving around a little bit. And that is in the middle of, of what's between you and that very nice star image that would be imaged by the Hubble scope because it doesn't have to deal with these problems. What it means for guiding is that those star images that we're trying to measure with such precision are moving around on the guide camera sensor, essentially all by themselves, having nothing to do with the mount or the scope. They're moving around or appearing to be moving around because of uh, astronomical seeing and all these atmospheric effects that we would just assume not have. And these movements and are, represent changes that happen 10 to 100 times per second. So there is no way you are gonna guide out these seeing deflections, not with any kind of a device that's within reach of amateur astronomers. So there's nothing you can do about them. 
And what you have to be careful of is that you don't get faked out by them. You have to have some way of distinguishing between these um, seeing induced movements of the guide star and the other movements that are caused by tracking errors. And if this isn't hard enough, um, the seeing isn't really stable in a given location. It can and usually does change night to night and even hour to hour. So here's an example. Um, this was done with a seeing monitor. Um, and this happened to be an observatory location where I am. So it's up at a high elevation in a really dark part of New Mexico. And it's generally good seeing conditions. So I won't get into all the, the units and the measurements here, but you can see we're chugging along down here for the first hour or so. And the seeing is quite good. It's one and a half arc seconds. And all of a sudden, just out of the blue, it, it ramps up and it gets twice as bad in the space of maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes. And then it gets better. Then it's back down here bumping along. And then all of a sudden later in the night, it now gets worse by another factor of two. So if you're imaging through these periods of time, which you will be, you don't have any way of knowing that this is happening. What you're gonna find is that your guiding gets bad here. You're gonna think that something's gone wrong with the guiding. And the, and the main camera images that you were exposing during this time are gonna have bloated stars. The stars are gonna be a lot bigger than the ones you were getting earlier in the night or in the middle of the night. Same thing down here. So this is just a difficult problem. There's, there's really no way to do anything about it. You just have to, from a guiding perspective, try not to get faked out by this and not make the matter worse than it needs to be. This is another way of visualizing what seeing is doing to you. This is actually from a university lab experiment. So it's, I think, a somewhat exaggerated view, but it's useful. This is what it looked like to take a picture of an artificial star image in a room with seeing um, with very, very short exposure times. Now, you remember what that airy disk looked like? that I showed you before, the nice circular ball of light in the center and the nice even diffraction rings that surrounded it. This is what it looked like if you're trying to take very short exposure times. Well, it's a mess, right? How, do you, how are you gonna wanna figure out where the center of mass, where the centroid is of this thing? Well, do you, you, know, you got this big octopus arm sticking out over here. Do you count that or not? And the answer is you will count it, if you're trying to measure this kind of a star image. Now, if you do nothing be other than take a, long ex a longer exposure of the same object, now things start to look a lot better, okay? Now there is a central brighter disk and a more even drop off of brightness as you move away from the center. What that means is that those centroid calculations that you're doing are gonna be a lot more accurate and they're gonna show a lot more variability. So this is how you actually get the camera sensor to help you with the problem. By using a longer exposure time, it averages and smooths out all of these high frequency ripples and fluctuations and gives you an image more like this that you can do something with. Here's another way of looking at it. This uh, was a test run where I was taking one second exposures. And this is just with no guiding at all. And this is just measuring the apparent movement of the guide star on the sensor. This is in declination from one exposure to the next. So you can see how much it's bouncing around, here, right? I mean, and you get to some of these things where it goes up by one and a half arc seconds. It comes back down by one and a half arc seconds. It's all over the map. If I did nothing but change the exposure time to four seconds, all of a sudden, this thing starts to look a lot better. It smooths out. We don't get the big range of fluctuations, right? We go from a range of three arc seconds down to a range of 
And the standard deviation of the movements drops again by about a factor of two. So now you can think what, what's going to happen to you. Imagine that you're the guy having to figure out how to do corrections for this guide star movement. And let's assume you're using short exposure times and you get into one of these things where it's up and down and it's all over the place. So if you, if you looked at the star down here and it's, it's offset by let's say minus 1.2 pixels, and you could say, well, all right, I need to move the telescope so that I push that star back in the opposite direction by 1.2 pixels. What you don't know is that in the very next camera exposure, it will already have moved by itself nearly all the way back to where you wanted it. So if you had issued a guide command here, you would have then made the problem worse because now you're gonna overshoot in the other direction. We call this chasing the seeing. You'll see that expression used on the forums. And that's what happens when you're using exposure times that are too short and guiding algorithms and guide uh, techniques that are being too aggressive and are trying to overcorrect for these seeing fluctuations when in reality, they can't correct for it at all. Now this would say, well, great, and just use really long exposure times. You know, don't not four, make it 10. Well, the problem with that is that most mounts can't go that long. They can't go even 10 seconds without having some significant tracking problem that you really do need to correct for. So you have to find a balance between what's too short an exposure and what's too long. And that will typically depend on the specifics of what your mount is able to do. One to two second guide ex guiding exposures are pretty typical and are usually pretty effective on most of the common kind of mass produced mounts that people have. For, as I said, for very high end mounts, you can stretch this out uh, you know, upwards of five or six seconds, maybe as long as 10. But most of us uh, won't have that luxury. So again, what is it that makes this so hard? What we've talked about so far is problems kind of on the measurement side of things. You know, what is the seeing doing to us? You know, what's the level of precision that, that we're expected to have in all these measurements? This is the flip side. Even after we figure all that out, we've done the best job we can for getting accurate measurements of how the guide star is moving around and not overreacting to seeing, we now find out that when we tell the mount to do something, it, generally speaking, doesn't do exactly what we want it for lots of reasons. There are any number of machining and assembly issues uh, that are present in these drive systems. And that I don't mean it, that as a harsh indictment. Um, this is just the real world of building equipment like this. And in, again, if we're talking about micron and sub arc second accuracy, it's nearly impossible to build a perfect set of machinery to do this. There's gonna be slight imperfections in the gears. Not all of the teeth will be machine, machined precisely the same way. The gears themselves won't be precisely circular. circular. If there's belts, those things cannot be perfectly tensioned. And if they're perfectly tensioned today, they probably won't be tomorrow because you've moved them out or the temperature has changed or whatever. So that you can see the list. These are all the kinds of things that a mechanical engineer has to worry about when he's gonna try to build a, a device that's capable of this kind of precise activity. So it's really no surprise that there are gonna be significant imperfections here and things that are gonna affect guiding. And this is kind of the manufacturing and assembly part of the thing. Um, another source of problems is the mesh of the gears. So again, it may have been done nearly perfectly in the factory, but then the thing gets shipped halfway around the world. It gets loaded up onto your friendly UPS truck and dumped down in your driveway someplace. There's no reason to think that those gears and all those uh, tighteners and fasteners in there are going to be exactly as they were the day the mount left the factory. 
And of course, there are what I call gross manufacturing and assembly errors. And this is, you know, an ugly reality. Um, some of the mounts that are made, particularly the lesser expensive ones, have um, a rather poor track record for consistency. So somebody will get a mount and it works right out of the box. The next guy will get, he thinks, the very same kind of mount and the thing will be a disaster because of you know, manufacturing errors that haven't been de detected, assembly errors that haven't been detected. In some cases, maybe a complete absence of any sort of quality insurance assurance before it's in your hands. And that generally means that the end user is going to have to figure out what's going wrong and find ways of mitigating these problems or repairing them or what have you. So this is the ugly reality on the mechanical side. And again, these all have an effect on how well we can do auto guiding. So here's an example of a typical kind of tracking error in right ascension. Um, this is just a simple view based on watching how the guide star moves in right ascension with no guiding. And you can see there's this kind of a sinusoidal movement. It starts out at the lock point. There's no, this is right precisely where we want it. It, it ends up going about 12 and a half arc seconds off track and it comes back down and it goes back up. And this is over a period of about five minutes or so. And we call this periodic error. And this is typical of nearly all geared mounts. Um, the good news is that, is that we can do things about this to make it better, but it is typically just a mechanical reality that you'll have to come to terms with. Um, the, the best way to do that is through a technique that's called um, periodic error correction. Um, and I'm gonna have to watch my time a little bit here. I think we're approaching an hour. Um, it is possible in software to produce what's called a periodic error correction curve. You may have encountered this. These things work best if they're implemented in the mount firmware. And it requires you to use typically a special purpose application to measure the shape and the period of the periodic error in your mount. You wanna do that over multiple worm periods you have to do some statistical processing on it to produce a smooth curve. And then you upload that to the mount. And from that point forward, the mount will apply those corrections without being told to do it. If this system is implemented correctly and the, and the PE curve is accurate, then this approach helps with guiding. It makes guiding easier. So you'll see this discussion on forums is whether, well, you know, does, does periodic error correction fight with guiding? And the answer it, it does not, assuming that the periodic error correction is implemented well and correctly. Uh, we've seen instances in the last year or so where uh, various kinds of mount developers have tried to do this and they've botched it. And so they end up with a with an outcome that is that is not what you want and actually does make guiding worse. Um, last comment on this: um, PhD2 has an additional predictive algorithm that we use um, for doing this kind of correction. It doesn't require you to to go through and measure the curve and do the programming, but it's best used on top of an accurate um, periodic error curve. So the next thing that's, a, that's a, a topic that you will absolutely encounter in declination in particular is what's called backlash. This is just a simple little uh, animation that shows you what backlash is. And you can see when the, imagine that this is the motor, okay? When you reverse direction on the motor, there's a period of time there where these gears are no longer meshed. So what that means is when you reverse direction, there's gonna be delay, a delay before these gears re-engage and this gear starts rotating the way you want it to. That's what's called backlash. And it shows up uh, fairly commonly on geared mounts. And I, we wanna spend a lot of time on this, but let, this is an example in declination, which is where the problem lives. 
and and we can see for whatever reason uh, the mount you know the telescope moved to the to the north um, by a considerable amount five arc seconds we don't care why it wasn't because of guiding you know maybe it was a wind gust maybe it was something else somebody touched it and so the guide software sees that that happened and it immediately starts issuing guide commands to move it back south but we go through I don't know, 10 or 12 of these commands and nothing's happening. And then suddenly those gears re-engage and now the axis moves and it pushes us down back to where we wanted the guide star to be. Well, that delay is what is represented by the backlash in the system. And you don't really want to do this because now you've gone through a period of maybe 30 seconds where that image is displaced. The guide stars are all out of position. The stars in your main image are out of position and you're probably gonna see elongated stars. If this had been a very quick correction, you would have a much better chance of not actually seeing that in your main camera image. And then there can be even more uh, uh, complications that I will get into in this. This is what we call stiction. Stiction is just a static resistance. So in addition to backlash, you have an additional resistance in the deck axis that causes us to not just recover from the backlash, but then it overshoots. And this thing becomes unstable. It goes into oscillation mode and typically can go for many, many minutes before it stabilizes and it may never stabilize. Here's another view of that. This is an example of measuring the deck axis in PHD2. So we send a bunch of guide commands to move the axis to the north. And then we say, turn right around and, and issue the same number of guide commands that move it to the south, okay? And this is what, how a perfect mount would respond. And it would get right back to where it started. The, the actual test is in the red dots. And this particular mount, even though we started telling it to go south, it made another move to the north. Then it didn't do anything for four more guide commands. Then it kind of got going a little bit. You think, all right, well, now it's starting to go. And then it got stalled out again over here. Well, if you're trying to write the guiding software for this, how are you going to deal with this, right? I mean, what is it you can tell this mount to do that's going to overcome these kinds of problems? And in a lot of cases, there's nothing you can do. This requires some kind of man, mechanical correction or adjustment um, to the deck axis. So I think I'm running late. I want to not get into some of the uh, more exotic terms like backlash compensation and whatnot. So let me just tie this off by take, moving back up to the big picture and recapping what it is that makes this guiding process hard. What are the implications to the guiding software? So we've seen how there's all kinds of measurement uncertainty for figuring out uh, what kinds of movements are occurring, what kinds of tracking errors, the need to separate that out from seeing related effects that you can't do anything about. It's like the old saying, you have to know what you can control and control them and let the rest go. And that's also true of guiding. What it means as well is that the guiding algorithms have to be pretty sophisticated. So you, you don't want to chase the seeing. You have to figure out what you can control and what you can't. And where possible, you have to try to uh, apply adaptive corrections to help overcome some limitations in the mount that you're trying to control. The goals, of course, are that you want nice round stars in your main camera images, and you want them to be as small as possible. So no elongated stars, and small stars, those are the goals. And you have to be able to measure those in your own way. A lot of times it's just perceptual. You look at the image and the stars look round enough. And so that's good enough. Uh, as you become more picky about this and you get further into the details, you have to be able to separate out limitations of your optics, you know, collimation, tilt, other kinds of odd aberrations from whatever effects are being introduced by guiding. But you know that's another long topic that we don't have time for. 
So guiding is best at handling the slow and steady and predictable errors, all the ones we've talked about, periodic error, some kinds of deck backlash, drift from polar alignment error. This, by the way, is one of the easiest things to control with guiding. And it's always a shame when people become compulsive about polar alignment and they're worried about whether their alignment error is one minute of arc or a half minute of arc. And, and truthfully, it really doesn't matter. Um, and it's not worth spending an enormous amount of time. If you can get your a polar alignment error down to say five arc minutes or less, you're gonna be in fine shape. Guiding is gonna take, the take care of the rest. And of course, the things we can't do anything about is all this high frequency, random star movement, vibrations, uh, high frequency gear errors, the kinds of things you, you, know, you hope you don't find in your system because there won't be anything you can do with the guiding to correct for them. Same thing is true of differential flexion. I mean, as I mentioned before, at some point you will encounter it. Um, and if it's ruining too many of your guide cam or too many of your main camera images, you'll have to take a different approach. So with that, um, I'll just say that, mention some of the typical guiding results we get. And having gone through now and explained all the, all the details and all the challenges, it, you could start to think there just isn't any way to make this work at all. But actually we do. Um, for nearly all the mounts that amateurs have that we see, they can generally get better than one and a half arc second RMS of those guide stars and all the details that are in their images. Um, for most of the common mounts that people have, we can generally get it down even below one arc second. And for the high end mounts, the really high quality stuff, those guys are guiding down in the 0.2 to 0.5 arc second range. And that's almost always uh, determined by the seeing conditions they have at their site. And again, I'm talking about measuring these things over elapsed time periods of hours. So it isn't just that you can achieve these results for you know, five or 10 minutes. People are generally getting these kinds of results pretty much all night long. So I'll wrap it up with that and say, you know, you can apply this to just about anything, uh, anything from an assembly that looks like this to this homemade uh, mount with a 24 inch RC on it. The guy uses PhD2 for this and does just fine. So with that, I'll call it the end. I'm sorry if I ran a little bit over. That seems to be the nature of the beast uh, with guiding presentations. All right, thank you, Bruce. It was uh, a great presentation. You could have gone another Half hour if you wanted to, it, it would have been shorter than the talk we had last month, right, Dee? <laughs> so um, we have. Uh, I like to talk. <laughs> yeah, he likes to talk. We have plenty of time for questions. So if you have any auto guiding questions or, of course, auto guiding problems you've been trying to figure out, uh, now's the time to ask. So, anybody? I have one, Richard. Sure, Lloyd, go ahead. So, um, I've heard different um, takes on uh, recalibration um, of your of your guiding. I I I've had better luck doing it, you know, infrequently, like maybe every third or fourth time. Um, some people never do it. I know if they have permanent setups. What what's your recommendation? I I wheel my mount out into the driveway every every time I image, so it's not a permanent setup. What is the best method um, for calibration of, of PhD? Well, I think, um, you know, you let experience be your guide. I mean, it, it's certainly a mistake to waste too much time calibrating over and over and over again. If you get a good calibration, you ought to keep using it. Now, in your case, the, the thing that really uh, forces it is if the guide camera or the guide telescope can rotate at all, that destroys the, the integrity of the calibration. You have to force it to, to be done again. So if you're careful about avoiding that, I mean, what I always used to do was just put some black painter's tape on there, some blue painter's tape on it, on two of the things and, and draw a little pencil line to make sure that everything was in the same rotational position. I generally wouldn't recalibrate each time 
Um, for people that don't have a lot of experience with it, I suggest they just do it once at the start of a night and then use it for the rest of the night. But there really isn't a rule. Um, the one thing I would say is that if you start to see guiding problems where you didn't have them before, the first thing to do is do a fresh calibration. Okay, thank you. May I ask one? Yes, please sure. go ahead. There, there are two ways that you can lengthen the period between um, uh, adjustments. Uh, one is to lengthen the exposure. The other is to take short exposures and put an interval uh, in there as well where no exposure is taken. So I could get five second guide intervals by either taking five second exposures or I might take one second exposure uh, with a four second you know, wait delay between them. Do you have any, uh, pardon the pun, guidance as to whether that the longer exposures are better for averaging out seeing, or are they worse because they smear the star around and you don't get as good a position? I mean, is, do you have guidance for us on how long the exposure should be as opposed to the guiding interval? Well, of course, um, it depends on the mount. So I think for most people, that isn't a, a question foremost in their mind because they want to take an exposure that's long enough to subdue some of the seeing effects, but they also want to be able to send guide commands to the mount uh, as often as they can because the mount um, is not a high-end mount and it has you know, issues with tracking. So let me come back to your question and say, let's imagine that we're dealing with a sophisticated mount that is capable maybe even of doing unguided exposures for several minutes. In that case, um, it works better if you send infrequent guide commands to the mount. But if you're taking very long exposures, that's gonna also slow you down when you're not doing guiding. So it'll slow you down when you're doing a calibration. It'll slow you down when you've done dithering and settling because nothing is happening except for maybe every 10 seconds. So we have features in PhD2 at least that allow you to separate those two things. You can choose an exposure time that's appropriate for your camera uh, and for your, your nighttime skies. And you can also control whether there's an additional delay that's added before sending commands to the mount. So, to, to try to be a little more specific, I probably would go up to camera exposure times that might be three or four seconds. And if I still felt that that was too, uh, too frequent a time for sending guide commands to the mount, then I would use this other delay interval that would lengthen that, um, the conversation time with the mount, if that makes sense. So, uh beyond say three seconds you're not getting any benefit of averaging out seeing you are technically but as a practical matter it, it you've reached a point of diminishing return so after three or say four seconds that's true now i'm assuming that the camera is sensitive enough that you're getting guide stars with reasonably high signal and noise ratios yeah. So, I mean, if you're down, you know, in the weeds with signal and noise, you're down in single digit values or something, you no. definitely want to be cranking those exposure times up. But if you have good SNR values, then it, you've hit a point of diminishing return, I would say from anything beyond four seconds. Thank you. Yeah. I have one. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Um... Uh, can PhD uh, use multi-star guiding? Yes. Works like a champ. Ooh, awesome. We implemented that, um, I'm going to say a year ago. Uh, it showed up in the 2.9 release. It's, it's the default now in the 2.6.10 release. So when you do an auto find with PhD2, it's going to go and find as many stars as it can in the frame and it will use up to 12 of them. 
so you don't have to do anything different. Uh, and it manages that, those stars and does the right thing. And generally speaking, um, well, as a, as a matter of the algorithm, it cannot do worse than single star guiding, and it frequently improves the guiding. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yes, uh, I'm very new to this. And uh, what is the guide star used for? Why do you need a guide star? Well, as opposed to what? <laughs> as opposed well, to nothing. Well, what, what does the guiding mean? Uh, you know, when you're guiding something, you're, you're, you know, showing it how to go somewhere or, you know, it, it's a point of reference. Yes. Okay. So the idea is that you take a picture through the guide camera and you figure out where all those stars are. Okay. Now let's assume everything was perfect then you would keep taking those exposures and keep measuring those star locations and they would never move, right? There would be not, no reason to guide. They would, they're just right where you want them. But that isn't the case because for all the reasons we've talked about, the mount isn't doing quite what you want it to do. It isn't tracking the sky perfectly. And so you have to use those guide stars to measure how much tracking error has occurred from the time you started. And then you send commands to the mount to adjust for that, to correct for the fact that it has wandered off track and you're pushing it back to where it's back on track. And that's what the guide star positions are used for. And then from that point, I could then go look at uh, the planets or uh, the moon or uh, uh, the nebula in Orion and uh, get a pretty good shot at it because the guide star uh, location is uh, pretty tight. Yes, I mean, you generally don't need to do that for lunar and planetary imaging, um, but you do for deep sky imaging. Okay, great, that clear, clears it up, thank you. Sure. I have one question. With the uh, calibration, if you have a rotator, does it, does PHD2, if I rotate the camera angle with the rotator, if you have it set up in the equipment, does it, does the calibration adjust? Yes, it does. Uh, good question. Uh, not that many people, at least in the past, have had rotators, but yes, as long as the rotator uh, supports an ASCOM standard interface, and they nearly all do nowadays, as long as you make that part of your PHD2 configuration and you mm -hmm. connect it to the rotator, then yes, any movements of the rotator automatically uh, cause an adjustment of the calibration data and you don't have to do anything. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. And, and that would only apply to uh, like an off axis guider that rotates with the rotator, is that correct? Using a guide scope that that would not uh, be necessary, would it? That's correct. Um, right, it, it, we're assuming that if you have a rotator, you're probably using an off-axis guider. But if not, if as you say, the only thing that's rotating is the main camera, then PHD2 doesn't care about any of that. Yeah, correct. In my case, I have an off-axis guider attached, so. Any other questions? And one more. Okay, Dave. Um, and one of the graphs that showed uh, FWHM, I should know what that means, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, full width at half max. Um, that's the standard way of measuring the size of a, of a star image. Um, because as I said, it's kind of a Gaussian profile. And so full width half max is a common measurement of what is the width of that profile halfway between the brightest and the dimmest star uh, brightness values? And, and people use that uh, as, a, as a unit of measure for seeing conditions and also for the sizes of the stars in their images. And you like it to be as small as possible.
Anybody else? Going once. Yeah, right. I, I have a I have a question I like okay. to ask. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, and to be fair, I, I use an ASI Air for the last year or so, so it's been a while since I've used the the PhD two with a uh, laptop. But uh, on the ASI Air, it does have an aggression setting that you can do, and I and I've forgotten what the other one is, and wondered what do I actually look for to how do I decide how to modify that aggression number. Um, I have no idea because I don't know what the ASI Air is doing. That's a okay. It's a Zewo product. It doesn't use. It does not use the real PhD two. Some people have the misconception that it does. Um, so I don't. That's something you'd have to ask them. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, so this may be. Hopefully, this is an inappropriate question, but it looks a lot like PhD2. Did, so they, they, they did not do some kind of a joint project with you guys? They just forked the code and ran with it? Yes. Um, they helped themselves to the code um, and they hacked it up in some way uh, that, that they know about. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the features are gone from it, but I have no idea what else they did and there wasn't any communication with us at all. I mean, that is the hazard of an open source software project. You kind of have to figure that somebody might do that and it's okay. It doesn't cause us any you know, financial damage or anything. I, I personally don't care much for that approach, but hey, it is what it is. So I was just curious if they had, um, I don't want to say ask, but if they had offered to work with you rather than just go their own way. No. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? We've got plenty of time. All right, here and none. So uh, thanks again, Bruce, for joining us. You're welcome to stay. Uh, <laughs> but I want to uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. And uh, you'll, you'll be pl uh, pleased to know you're our largest, uh, you've dr drawn our largest crowd so far, but of course the lecture series that I'm doing had a lot to do with that, but uh, I think we maxed out about uh, 78, so that was a pretty decent crowd. So Yeah, that's uh, a big number for Zoom, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. You must yeah. be doing something right. Yep. Oh, you haven't seen anything yet, just, just wait. <laughs> uh, so great. Uh, just want to thank you again for joining us, and I hope you uh, perhaps come back in the future. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to do that, and thank you very much for inviting me. If you, yeah. if you could send me a link uh, to whatever the YouTube is when you're all done, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, folks. Yep. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and move on with the meeting. So as usual, uh, this is the time when we can uh, share our images. So, of course, uh, any Kalamazoo Astronomical Society members that have any new images to share, we'd love to see them. And, of course, we do have many guests uh, still with us here tonight. So if you have any, you know, somewhat recent images you, you would like to share, that would be awesome as well. But I'm afraid we don't have time to look at every image you've ever taken. Um, so uh, let's see. I, I, oh, there he is. Uh, Pete, you want to show us the uh, Orion Nebula picture before we... Uh, yeah, Look sure. Anything else? Yeah. Um, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, I finally completed my uh, Orion Nebula. It's just straight here in Pix Insight. It's a H H alpha uh, LR. Well, H H alpha RGB. I used H alpha for my luminance layer. Um, it's a uh, I'm trying to think now. It's been a few months now. I believe it's 20 hours total worth of data uh, taken here outside uh, Kalamazoo. So just uh, did real basic uh, processing with this. Um, you know, LRGB uh, did the RGB processing, and then in PixInsight used the um, you know uh, LRGB uh, processing command and just put my H alpha data in there, um, and it turned out. Not too bad. It's a little noisy, but being winter in Michigan, there's not a whole whole lot of opportunity to get a lot of data, but I was pretty pleased overall with how it came out. You want to zoom in a little bit so we can see some of the detail? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, this was 
This was taken with um, a sharp star, uh, 60 millimeter. It's the EDPH2 um, refractor. It's with a um, their uh, uh, reducer corrector lens uh, are on it. So it's like a 250 millimeter um, with an old CCD. It's a, um, it's a Kodak 8300 base, um, the 383L plus from um, ATEC um, through some um, astronomic uh, filters on top of my uh, astrophysics uh, <laughs> 1100 mount. So way overkill mount for a little 200 millimeter refractor. But guiding was good. PhD handled it. Perfect. <laughs> Off axis guider. If Bruce were still here, he'd be very happy. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Pete. Yep. Um, I don't have a final image to share, but I thought I would show you uh, what I was up to last night. I'll, I'll talk about more what I was doing with the remote telescope uh, last night. But for those of you that don't know, I'll, I'll just mention this because we do have a lot of guests here tonight. The KAS has a remote telescope at Arizona Sky Village, which is located in Portal, which is a very tiny village of like 100 people. Uh, in fact, I can show you the telescope uh, live. So this is a, a live view of the telescope right now. And of course, it's extremely exciting just to see it sit there. That's, that's what it does most of the time, <laughs> at least during the day. Uh, but I was using the uh, scope last night for, again, reasons I'll mention later. And I uh, continued on a project that I've been working on with the Rosette Nebula. And I've been using the 20 inch, you know, the big scope in the picture there. Uh, to create this image. And of course, the rosette is pretty big. Uh, so I'm just capturing the very center of it. But here's one of the raw images that I got last night. So let me tell you just a little bit about this. Again, this is with the 20 inch plane wave. We have a STX16803 CCD camera. Uh, I guess CCD cameras are kind of on their way out, but it's still an extremely good camera. Uh, much better electronics than what you'll find in any of the uh, lower priced uh, cameras you get today. If you set this thing to cool to minus 20, it goes to minus 20, not unlike the ZWO cameras or stuff like that. So we used a um, Astrodon H-alpha filter. We have the three nanometer slit uh, version, which are the really pricey ones. I mean, when we purchased that uh, H-alpha filter, it was $1,200. I can't imagine how much it is now, but that, that, that was like five, six years ago. And this is a 20-minute image of the central region of the Rosette Nebula. And uh, Mike Patton emailed me last night saying he wasn't going to use the other telescope of his in the observatory, which is in the same building, because the scene might be bad, but it turned out the scene was actually very good last night. So, uh, Mr. Patton, you missed out on a good night. So again, this is just one 20 minute image and you can zoom in here. I, I always love to zoom in on the uh, fork region there. You can see the stars there and a bit of noise, but uh, we can zoom over there. Oh, I went too high. Ah, shoot. We can zoom down there and there it is. There's that little forky thing. I, I always like that. So that's pretty decent uh, resolution. So I plan on doing about, um, Oh, about 10 hours in H alpha. I have no idea how many hours I have now, but eventually I'll do um, as many hours uh, with the O3 filter and our S2 filter as well. So that's my uh, progress report on that. I did take a picture of the moon uh, last Saturday because I had to run out to the observatory, but I have not processed the pictures yet. I've been so busy with our newsletter, the lecture series, getting people to renew, getting speakers finalized and all that stuff. I haven't had time to come back and work on that, but uh, it was really cold out there. So I, I, I made quick work of it and I was in and out. <laughs> Anybody else want to share any pictures? I can show one, Richard. All right, Lloyd, well, that's great. Um... It's it's a uh, very recent, um, like within the last minute or two. <laughs> I'm imaging right now, so all right. I'm I'm going after the heart nebula. I'm mostly just trying out the mount in the very cold weather to see how well it works. But um, nope, it just switched. Now we're probably looking at um oxygen. 
So it's much fainter than the H alpha signal, but, uh, I don't know. It's going, things are going well. I, I got this new little camera down here too, in the corner that is uh, showing the, the telescope and it's really pretty sensitive. It's pretty impressive. Um, that it can actually do that. Um, but there's no, there's no light on there other than the ambient. So you can, you can see it pretty well, but anyways, things are going well. Great. All right. Live from Lloyd's driveway. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Who's next? Who wants to share some pics? We can, uh, <clears throat> we can try another live view. All right, David. Um, yeah, I do see, did see we have clear skies tonight. And it's uh, 16 degrees. So, hey, that's, uh, that's balmy for what we've had recently. Should be able to reconnect. I've never done this uh, both on Zoom and at the same time. So uh, let's see how that recovers. Yeah. So uh, someone mentioned ASI Air. This is uh, working with ASI Air, currently looking at um, uh, IC443, I believe it is, uh, a supernova remnant in uh, Gemini. Oh, very cool. So that's uh, about four stacked images at this point. Um, in the middle of Battle Creek with the uh, <clears throat> with your friendly neighborhood uh, streetlight right in front of the house. Uh, I have a special relationship with that streetlight. <laughs> uh, earlier, uh, we were we were as we were listening to our PhD two. Um, developer there, uh, I was tracking around uh, uh, 0.4 RMS. It's definitely gone a little haywire now. Very cool. Thanks, David. Do you want to des describe your equipment? I don't, I don't think you mentioned that. Uh, this is, yeah, this is uh, actually brand new. I've just been, uh, I got it in November, but this is like the only the fifth night I've been able to been uh, out with it. Uh, a Red Cat 71 Petsful refractor. Uh, I'm using a, an ASI 2600 uh, color camera um, on a, a Rainbow Astro 135 mount. It's a very portable uh, um, system, um, very capable. And uh, uh, using it, I found out that I had to. I had to calibrate the uh, sensor tilt in my ASI camera. It was off uh, a, a surprising amount, um, but uh, quickly learned how to calibrate sensor tilt using a laser. Um, and, uh, you know, at first I thought uh, the problem was with the telescope, uh, bringing a brand new telescope, but uh, after dealing with the sensor tilt within the camera, I'm uh, very, very pleased and excited uh, for this new telescope. So, um, Red Cat 71, ASI 2600, uh, and the RST-135 mount. Great, David. Looks good. So yeah, there we're getting, looks like, uh, right around 0 .5, 0 0.5 RMS guiding. Yeah, those little rainbows, they're great. No backlash on that, right? Since it's belt driven. Uh, yeah. It, well, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's a harmonic drive. So, right. Right. Um, pretty, pretty. It's it's different. I wouldn't say that it's 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 better than than your worm gears uh, or or other types of gearing. Uh, it's just different. But because uh, uh, one of the differences, uh, uh, it's very strong. So no counterweights. Uh, you don't need to balance your load. In fact, it. It performs better if your load is a little out of balance, um, uh, and that's and that's part of uh, the draw for me in making that whole kit portable. Is uh, uh, you know there's a counterweight 
and the counterweight shaft that uh, I don't have to carry. So that makes that, uh, that part nice as well. All right, thanks, David. All righty, who else wants to uh, share? Anybody else got any pictures to share? All right, here and none, we'll move on. Uh, so uh, usually at this point, we share some interesting images from other astrophotographers, you know, stuff we've seen online. I thought about trying to put together a collection of images of Comet Leonard, but I'm sure most of you have seen them. But if not, you can get on, well, probably Facebook. If you do the Facebook, uh, you can get on, of course, uh, Twitter or just search the web. There are lots of great images of Comet Leonard out there. So I hope uh, some of you got to see it. Uh, I never did. I never got to see the bloody thing, but uh, or let, let alone take a picture of it. But uh, but I hope some of you got pictures of Comet Leonard, but if not, there are lots of great pictures online. Uh, moving on, um, we always talk about new astrophotography related equipment or software and uh, something just came up today. Let me share my screen here. I got an email from OPT and uh, you know, I, I thought, oh, it's just another refractor, but uh, they have these uh, ASCAR refractors. I don't know, if it sounds like a relatively new company. I, I know very little about them. But what caught my eye is these little boogers aren't triplets or quadruplets, they're quintuplets. So that's a lot of glass for such a small telescope. Like this one here is like a 90 millimeter uh, that sells for $200. They go by the focal length, which is unusual. Usually, you know, in the name, you know, like a F FSQ 106, that refers to the aperture, but here they have FRA uh, 500, which is the focal length of the telescope. So uh, I haven't read too much about these on the website yet, but uh, yeah, quintuplet, that's a new one for me. So that's a lot of glass. So Pete, you might have to sh sell that uh, Sharp Star and get one of these and try it out. And there's, there's a lot of really good reviews, uh, particularly on that. Um, FRA 400, uh, uh, you know, of course, you don't need a flattener or anything uh, being a quintuplet, uh, but uh, they appear to have very, a very good track record. A lot of people are, are enjoying that company uh, and the glasses they're putting out. Uh, those, those are really good deals. Yeah. No, I, I like my Sharp Star. <laughs> my next scope would be a plane wave or something. Oh, uh-oh. Watch out. All right. Go drive over there and pick it up. Anybody else want to share any new equipment that came out? Did anyone get any uh, astrophoto goodies for the holidays as a gift? Yeah, I got a, a rotator from ah, okay. uh, Pegasus Astro. It's the uh, Falcon rotator. I had been trying to decide between this and um, Optech made one. It's been out forever. Um, the Pegasus had a little bit higher uh, load rating. Um, they're both basically the same price. Um, heard some really good reviews on this. And I like the blue. Color is important nowadays. So <laughs> makes it look cooler. Of course, you won't so. see the color when it's on your FOSS yeah. cam. You'll, it'll, it'll just look gray. Yeah. Well, even more important, especially for like my Sharp Star is... This thing is about five, I think four or five millimeters thinner than the Optech, the um, the LE, um, uh, what's the Pixis? Other? Yeah, yeah, Pixis, yep. Yeah, it's a couple millimeters thinner. So that's really important for those that are, that are looking for every little back focus uh, millimeter needed. So this one, I need it with that Sharp Star for sure. And even with my RC, it starts getting kind of tight a little bit of when I'll take throw everything in there. Um, but yeah, now I just need to actually go install it. So <laughs> it's cold outside, so I don't want to do that. Okay. I figured you got a rotator from, from your question earlier because you mentioned uh, calibration with rotators. I'm like, oh, he got yeah. a rotator. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't like going outside and rotating stuff. Now I can actually start doing mosaics and stuff again. <laughs> Okay, Richard, as a novice, what does a rotator accomplish or what does it do? 
it rotates the camera so you can get different frames of view. And we, we never got a rotator for the remote telescope because it's a square chip. So what, why, why do you need a rotator with a yeah. square chip? So we never got one, but yeah, it's, yeah. It, it just rotates the camera, gives you different yeah. perspectives. It's yeah. a lazy it's, way of changing the, uh, you yeah. know, position of the camera. Remotely. And it's also good, especially like galaxy season. If you're looking for a guide star, even if you have a bigger guide camera, you can also kind of start yeah. moving the, you know, the whole assembly kind of moves and your guide, you know, your guide camera move with the off axis and kind of poke around a little bit. But more importantly, I mean, especially when I was doing my M31 where the whole, the whole framing was like almost <laughs> 90 degrees off. Luckily I had a big enough chip and the focal length was so big. It didn't matter. I could, I could just re crop it a little bit. It would have been better on almost 90 degrees, but um, like I said, there was too many bugs outside at the time, so I didn't want to go out there, so I just went with it. <laughs> oh, come, it's just a few steps away, though. Come on. Hey, those bugs are big outside. <laughs> Not carry... as big as down in Florida. I'm sure the guys down in Florida here have much bigger bugs to deal with. So <laughs> I, I don't know if they're bigger, but they come out in larger numbers. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> That carry you away. Some of the other benefits of the rotator, you know, not only framing uh, that image just like you like, but of course, I think you already mentioned the mosaic. You know, each panel of a mosaic um, uh, needs to be rotated if, if you truly want a grid pattern in your, in your mosaic. So they're essential for mosaics. But also, um, if you revisit uh, a target, uh, say, every year, and want to get the exact same framing and rotation uh, so that you can stack all those images together. Uh, oh, yeah. Even longer integration time. So being able to plate solve, including rotation, uh, even a year later or, or yeah. uh, you know, anything of that nature, a rotator is really nice. Yeah. Well, and plus, too, like when I pull my camera off to, like, recharge a desiccant or even clean off my optics and I'm getting everything back together, I can at least get it right back to the same pretty close to the same framing, you know, so I can, you know, for stacking and stuff. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty accurate. I did use the Pixis LE uh, mm -hmm. for quite a while. Um, oh, okay. And uh, that was really nice. Uh, I think that Pegasus one, uh, that Pegasus one looks a little nicer, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> I like the, Pic the, the Pixis LE, that was nice, but um, that, that Pegasus, they, they did a real good job engineering that, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, like I said, it was really close when I really started looking at the specs. Like I said, it's just a little higher capacity. Not that, I mean, the camera sizes, the cameras are getting lighter in general. You don't have big, yeah. like, you know, really monster CCD heavy weights, but um, it's good to have that capacity. Well, I'm glad uh, Jeff Dickerman isn't here, the owner of uh, Optech, because he'd be very upset. He is a member, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, moving on here. Um, since this is our uh, first SIG meeting of the year, I wanted to see if anyone had any uh, astrophotography uh, plans for 2020, you know, images you want to take or trips you want to take to like star parties to take pictures or just take trips to dark sky sites anybody want to share anything like that just thought i'd open it up doesn't sound like it i'd like to get the neef yeah i did go to the last neef in 2019 but yeah that's uh that's Candyland. <laughs> It is, it is great to go if, if, if no one's ever been. But uh, we're hoping that maybe uh, later this year, uh, we're going to try again. I don't know if Dave Garden's actually there. I see his uh, black uh, screen, but uh, I don't know if he's out in his observatory imaging or something. But uh, he has a piece of dark sky property up in the Manistee Forest. And we've been trying to get up there for years. So we might do a, a garden getaway up to his property to do some imaging. We can make that a uh, official SIG function. We can invite uh, imagers up there. We can have a whole imaging party. So we might do that in maybe July or August. September might be a trip to Great Lakes Stargaze, depending on how that falls together. 
Yeah, I've been putting together the um, annual list of star parties. I didn't do it last year because of COVID, but uh, I figured I'd bring back the list this year, and I haven't seen any dates yet. And usually they have that stuff announced by now, but I don't know. Dave, are you there? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, about August or sometimes usually up there. Milky Way is nice and south is a good time. All right. August is what I was thinking, so we can talk about that. I got plenty of time. Cool. <laughs> you got power? <laughs> he said he did. Oh, yeah, I got power. It's sporadic, but there's some there. Uh, I just got one of those new F-150s with the built-in huge generator, so I can power <laughs> us for a long time. <laughs> All right. Uh, I look forward to it. I was hoping to get up there this year. I just got to get get a tripod for my uh, astrophysics mount. <laughs> oh, yeah, tearing everything down, carrying up, and that's what sucks about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on, a uh, quick note about the remote telescope. Um, it's been about three three weeks or so. I, I sent out an email to everyone that has to renew their uh, annual uh, subscription to use the remote telescope. There are some that haven't done it yet. I suspect uh, some won't renew because uh, they haven't been using it, but uh, some have and haven't renewed yet. So I'll be after you soon. And I do want to give the happy report that our new auto guider is installed. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we had a Lodestar X2 auto guider on there, which was, you know, it's a very good camera, a uh, very good auto guiding camera, but it had a relatively tiny field of view. And uh, with our on axis guider, you know, that, that thing has such a large field of view. We wanted to get something with a larger field because there are parts of the sky where it's difficult to obtain guide stars. So we got a ZWO. Now, let me take a break here. I, I hear people say it differently. Is it ZWO or, or is it ZWO? How do people say that? Is tomato, like a, tomatoes. Tomato, tomato, doesn't matter? Okay, so <laughs> I, I just don't want to offend anyone if I say it wrong, but to me, it's ZWO. Z, ZWO just sounds weird, but it's a ZWO ASI 174mm mini auto guider camera. It has 5.3 times the field, uh, the imaging field of the old X2, so much, much larger field. Uh, Jim Kurtz got that uh, focused along with the assistance of Mike Patton there. And uh, just last night, I uh, managed to save the calibration. I haven't done that yet, but I saved the calibration. So for those of you that do use the remote scope, uh, you won't have to recalibrate it. But what I might do is maybe do a bunch of recalibrations and average them out and put in the average and see if that makes it better. I mean, the, the guiding has been great, as you can see from my image of the Rosette Nebula there. But uh, you know, the, the, the guiding curve is a lot more razory, you know, jig jaggy than it was before, but I don't know. Um, we'll see, but, uh, so far it's uh, been guiding just fine. And I do want to mention, of course, as always, that Owl Observatory is available for use. We have a, you know, a permanently mounted telescope there. We have an astrophysics 1600 GTO mount, nice heavy duty mount comparable to our paramount with the remote scope. Uh, we have we do have a 16 inch uh, meat on there, which is pretty long focal length, but we do have a focal reducer for it. But we need to still get the proper spacers for, for the focal reducer. Uh, but we do have a Teleview 101 NP uh, imaging system, and we do have a ZWO uh, ASI 074 camera out there. So if you don't want to set up a camera in the cold and, uh, you know, for those of you that can't image inside from your backyard like me, uh, you can go out to Al Observatory. I know it's cold, but uh, it's there. So quick preview for next month. We got an excellent guest speaker. Uh, Lloyd came through with a great suggestion. We're going to have, and I'm, I, I need to rehearse his name between now and next month, but we have uh, Agapub. Agapias Ilia. I'm not sure. I, I, I know I'm not saying that right, but I'll, I'll work on it. And uh, he's going to speak on planetary imaging tools, method, and results. And uh, I'm going to really encourage all members to join us because, you know, tonight's speaker was, say, you know, from Southern California, which is 
you know, nice. But this guy isn't from North America at all. He's going to be joining us from Cyprus, the island in the Mediterranean. Yes, that's Cyprus. When we start at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's going to be 3 a.m. for him, local time. So everyone needs to join us to, to show your support for him, uh, you know, uh, uh, joining us. But, of course, he said he's up at night all the time anyway, and it's no big deal for him because I, I gave him a chance to back out. And I'm like, you do know it's 8, 8 p.m. Eastern time, right? He's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, yeah, he's going to be talking about planetary imaging. Uh, he has some pretty decent planetary uh, images on his website, which, which you can find. Um, of course, you'll have to figure out his uh, uh, name. And uh, that should be a great talk. And we do have uh, two other great speakers planned left uh, for this season as well. We'll have uh, David Churchill joining us in March. And then Eric Schreuer will talk about uh, Star Trails in April. And that'll close out the season. We did plan on going till May, but since we'll probably be stuck on Zoom uh, by, the, by then, um, I figured uh, by May, it'll be nice weather. We won't have a great turnout for whoever we get. And I figured we'd just bag it for, uh, for, for May. So, so we'll finish up the season here in April. And I would like to do another uh, season, of course, of this. Uh, but number one, we'll need help looking for speakers. You can't let, you know, you shouldn't rely on me to do it by myself. And uh, I'm really hoping we can at least, you know, maybe do at least one season in person at Western as we originally planned. So, so that's the idea. You know, and I did want to mention here, it's not exactly astrophoto related, but I wanted to mention this is I, I got final final confirmation today, but our guest speaker for the February general meeting will be Jay Pasikoff. Uh, some of you might not know him, but he's a uh, world renowned uh, astronomer from Williams College in Massachusetts. Uh, he's an author. He's written astronomy textbooks and other astronomy books, but uh, he's you know for probably first and foremost known as one of the greatest eclipse chasers in the entire world. He has now been to 74 different solar eclipses. Not all total, of course, but 74 solar eclipses, total, annular, partial, hybrid, all of them. So He'll be our special guest speaker for the February 4th meeting, and I uh, do want a massive crowd for that. In, in fact, we might get such a massive crowd, we might have to do the presentation as a webinar, and then uh, we can try to, try to switch back over to Zoom meeting uh, to have our regular uh, after the talk uh, uh, discussion. So that meeting might be a little different depending on the number of people we get to register because I'm going to plug that to the people uh, taking the lecture series too because I want to guarantee we have a massive audience for that. And of course we have Alex Filipenko who's going to join us in May, world-renowned uh, cosmologist. So we're you know hopefully finishing up our uh, exclusive Zoom meetings here with some pretty heavy uh, speakers. So if there's nothing else, we will go ahead and officially call it an evening. So thank you for joining us for the January uh, KAS Astrophotography.